Hi, good morning, everyone, and welcome. This is Seek Sustainable Japan and our sub series, which we try to do at least once a month, uh, about short takes 30 minutes of short takes about sustainability in Japan uh, between two of us consultants and sustainability focused. Uh, people working on different sides of Japan. So I'm JJ Walsh here in Hiroshima, Japan, and... Hi, I'm Tova Kinooka. I'm usually in Yokohama, but today I'm in Ebis in central Tokyo. So welcome, and if you have any comments or questions, please add them along the way. Uh, it is the last day of August, Tova. How have you survived the summer? Uh, <laughs> with a lot of... Um, yeah, moaning and groaning, I think, is the honest answer and just sort of keeping out of the heat as much as I can. So, yeah, yeah. I'm not built for this and I don't think no. humans generally are. No, and yeah. people have been talking about the hottest summer on record all around the world. We've had heat waves and everything. Um, but one of the things that I wanted to point out is this excellent article uh, written by Matt Alt, who I've had on the show a couple times. Uh, over the years. He's a writer, content creator, translator, and he writes for The New Yorker. And he had this excellent article about the shock of Japan's extreme heat mm -hmm. and how extreme heat is now changing the culture because Jap Japanese culture in terms of summer festivals yeah. and other cultural related things, it's just it's we have to readjust. And I, I went to a summer festival in Sado Island. Most days are like 37 degrees, even on Sado Island, which is supposed to be cooler. Um, the, lo the people at the festival were saying they had a lot of heat stroke, like people mm. just not able to adjust, not used yeah. to it. We have to shift the way that we deal with heat. And in his article, Matt's talking about uh, it's really hitting and uh, really killing a lot of elderly um, mm -hmm. because especially this year, the price hikes of electricity went together with the heat wave, the hottest every year. And a lot of elderly weren't used to using air conditioning and not turning it on, even yeah. if they had it. Mm -hmm. And then you've got other issues in Tokyo, like cutting down a thousand trees for the Jingu Gaian project. So there's a lot of like yeah. old ideas which have been set in motion and really hard to change. And then it's time for reconsideration. Mm -hmm. um, now, one of the things that you pointed out was the change in the construction industry. So that's nice to see that these, yeah. these traditional techniques are, the ideas are changing a bit, right? Beginning to, slowly, we hope, because um, there was a great article um, in the Japan Times you can see there about the scrap and rebuild culture um, and now beginning to, to come under the, the microscope, I guess, for um, its environmental impact. Um, and as the article describes, I mean, you can walk around anywhere here. I know it, my area and around here in Ebis, um, you know, you're forever seeing perfectly usable buildings being torn down and a new one built in its place just because people have this preference for new and of course the construction industry um very strong ties to government and so on so you know uh, there's that's become very much um sort of the way of doing things people don't really want to take on a, a second hand home they have very little value um which you know for me coming from the uk where you know, a property goes up in value over its lifetime. Um, it seems really weird that here it's depreciating. As soon as it's been sort of used or lived in, the value of the actual building is going down. Um, and a lot of these buildings are being pulled down when there's really, um, you know, no need. They've still got plenty of years left in them. You know, Japan builds very well. <laughs> the quality of construction is good. Um, so it's interesting to see that being challenged now and uh, sort of apparently, according to the article, more people being willing to consider sort of reform uh, uh, renovated um, homes and offices rather than building new and also the materials themselves sort of moving away perhaps from concrete with a really high um, carbon footprint to more uh, sustainable buildings there's a great example of the um, building in Yokohama big office high rise that's been built entirely of wood um, or the you know the frame obviously of wood um, so I'm looking forward to going to visit that actually sometime soon um, so 
yeah, I, I think there's a reckoning coming in yeah, this industry. For sure. Yeah. And it's like um, I've mentioned in previous ones, the Minka Summit, right? Last yes. year, uh, they had their first one. This year, they had their second one. Uh, hundreds of people come to rural areas of Japan and they learn about how to live in rural areas comfortably, how yeah. to remodel these old houses beautifully in modern ways that makes them relevant. Um, there's so much enthusiasm. Um, part of the trip, this 10 day trip that I just did to Sado Island, but I took 10 days mm -hmm. so I could go visit some of the people that I met on the Minka Summit and see their places in person. Oh, fantastic. So yeah. I've got those videos uh, coming out. I did a, a few lives, had trouble with the Wi Fi, of course, in rural areas, <laughs> um, but I did take good video, and those yeah. videos are coming up soon on my channel. But mm. You know, even doing a talk in Kyoto on my way back uh, for the creative mornings. It's a really interesting uh, new kind of community building talk style. Mm -hmm. And they uh, had it in a reused old like derelict building that they remodeled very simply and had big open spaces for kids to play. And it, that's such a beautiful thing about reusing yeah. these old structures. You can keep so much space, mm -hmm. uh, which is really hard to do if you buy like a new prefab yes. kind of yeah. idea, right? Yeah, well, exactly. I mean, I, I know around our area, sort of a lot of the older houses are quite a sort of a decent size and often have a bit of space, you know, garden space around them. But then those get sold off and pulled down and they build three or four new houses crammed together on those same, um, you know, site on that where one house was. So yes, you're getting a, a lovely new shiny house that, you know, everything works beautifully, etc. But <laughs> you've got this much space between you and your neighbours, um, no outdoor space. So it's, yeah, um, I think the quality of life you can have if you're willing to go with an older building and renovate that can be quite different. Right. And then, you know, you're saving in terms of environment and community value, yeah. sustainability. You've got both because yes. you're preserving traditional craftsmanship, but also you're preserving the culture for the future because the people you hire to fix your house are using traditional methods usually. Yeah. And so you're also preserving that culture for the future. Um, also, so much less waste. Yes. Uh, so much less yeah. carbon use because you're reusing the good materials, the good bones, as people yeah. call it, right? Mm -hmm. Exactly, yeah. exactly. Yeah, the, the carbon footprint, I mean, they talk about it in the article. It's significantly, it's almost half um, the average sort of uh, renovation versus building from scratch. So, that I mean, yeah. that's a significant difference. It's huge. Mm. It's huge, yeah. And it looks so beautiful and it yeah. adds, <laughs> adds so much appeal to neighborhoods, right? Yeah. People in, in touristy areas or in areas trying to develop tourism, they have so much more appeal if they have these beautiful old houses um, instead of new prefab yeah. buildings that just don't don't look like anything special <laughs> in terms of visitors, even from Japan, in terms yeah. of attracting visitors, right? Exactly, exactly. Yeah. Now, you had a really interesting uh, SDGs manga. I, <laughs> tell us about it. So um, the survival series of manga, which um, people, some people watching might be familiar with, I think it's written actually by people from um, South Korea, but uh, it's you know, hugely popular series in Japan. And they've got them on all kinds of topics. And both my daughter when she was younger and now my son, who's almost eight, um, is so into this. You know, it's it's got fun little characters. Um, it's beautifully drawn, as you can see. Um, but this SDGs one, my son um, picked up recently and chose that. So I was very happy about that. Um, and I was a bit skeptical at first. You know, I don't really, I'm, I'm not a manga person, I have to say. Um, but actually, when I started looking at it, it's really good. Um, and, you know, it. there's a lot of uh, sort of SDG talk, I think, in schools, which is a very superficial level. And, you know, kids get told, oh, yes, SDGs are important and good. And they get sent home with, you know, a paper straw or something. Or, yeah, my son came home with, I think, uh, a, a straw made of bamboo and but in a plastic packet ridiculously um I know um and so there's this sort of 
yeah, SDGs washing, I guess, going on, um, which is almost more dangerous because then people think they're doing good stuff, but actually it's nowhere near enough. But this actually goes a lot deeper. So it will introduce um, the topics of each of the SDGs um, in a fun way that the kids can understand and relate to, have a laugh about because, you know, the characters are getting into these crazy situations. But then at the end of each topic, it's got a quiz about that particular SDG. So it'll have one, for example, about what is fair trade. Um, and it'll give you three options. It's what, number one, two or three. What do you think? And then the characters below are kind of thinking about it and giving their opinion. And, and then on the next page, it gives you the correct answer and explains why. So it's actually really good in terms of educational value and explaining what these things mean. They're not just a, a, a pretty, you know, logo. Um, so I am really, you know, happy to see this. And my son was saying, I think, I think everyone at school should read this, you know, all the schools are like, great, take it in, show your teacher. Um, so we'll see what happens. That's awesome. Now, uh, going to summer festivals, I, I did, you know, try my best to be a sustainable festival goer. Um, <laughs> now, even if your festival isn't really focused on SDGs, uh, using a lot of plastic, one thing I was trying to look for is things that I could just buy and have in my hand or on paper in terms of food. Uh, and I was handed my first plastic cup. I was like, okay, that's my festival cup. Yep. <laughs> and I kept washing it and asking the next vendors, can you use the same cup? And they were like, yeah, great idea. Why don't we do that next year? And then I talked to the organizers and they said, actually, in previous years, they had done the reusable cup. Um, so it's, it's hard when you, after COVID, a lot of festivals just coming back. Yeah. Uh, it can be hard to have that organization needed mm -hmm. to do the reusables, but they had a really good garbage uh, sorting area. The people, they asked people to carry around their waste or give it back to the vendor you bought it from. Mm -hmm. um, so there was a little bit more thought than your typical festival. So it was nice to see that. Yeah. Good. Good. Yeah, it'd be great to see more of that because th there are options, right, um, rather than single-use plastic. So it'd be good to see more of that sort of coming into yeah. events. Absolutely. Um, now, one thing I've got coming up uh, this next week is I'm talking, and Tova, you're based in Tokyo, um, <laughs> but I'm moderating a panel uh, talking about even in Tokyo, how can you get out into the more rural, quiet, natural spaces, even in Tokyo. And uh, on the panel are some amazing panelists. John Dobb, uh, most people know him. He's a YouTube creator, uh, one of the most prolific. I think he makes a video like every week for more than 10 years. He's been all over Japan and he is based in Tokyo. And a lot of his videos are going to lesser known off the beaten track mm -hmm. areas. Uh, another person on the panel, Christina Demina, she's amazing. Her uh, following on Instagram, she also writes for Matcha. <laughs> and if you look at her Instagram, she describes herself as an over tourism avoider and the rural Japan like enthusiast, right? Mm -hmm. And she's got some great insights for places even inside Tokyo. Yeah. Um, that just you can't believe it. It's inside <laughs> Tokyo. So we're going to have uh, a lot of great uh, insights. Another panelist uh, from Inside Japan Tours, Robert Moran. Now, Inside Japan Tours is one of the few companies in Japan with B Corp Ooh, certification. Great. And he is the global sustainability manager. So he's going to talk a more sustainable travel focused as well, give some insights. Mm -hmm. um, it's free to join. So I'll put the link here. Uh, you have to pre-register. Um, and they will have some interesting polls as we're doing uh, the talk show. It'll be live, um, but yeah, private, uh, just for people who register. Yeah. Um, but they've already started some of their polls. So Tokyo is a destination where you can enjoy uh, forest bathing, getting out to parks, uh, doing outside onsen, hot springs, or going to island, different huh. islands as well. And um, that's yep. all technically in Tokyo. We'll be talking about all these. The uh, most popular is forest bathing, which <laughs> was, was fun to see. Have you Brilliant. have you found some lesser known remote areas of Tokyo to enjoy in all your years there? 
Um, I don't know, because when I come to Tokyo, it tends to be for work usually. So I, I, I'm stuck in office buildings. Um, although, you know, we do sort of go to parks like Yoyogi or the Odaiba area. We've got some parks there, um, Shiba Koen and stuff. There are little oases. Um, but I, I'm fortunate that I live in, you know, uh, Yokohama area where we've got quite a lot of green, actually. And near us, there's a, a huge park um, called uh, Kodomo Shizen Koen, which is kind of children's nature natural park nature park um and it yeah you can just go off on little trails in that and uh, you wouldn't know that you're in a really urban area actually it's brilliant we're lucky yeah amazing and one of the places john is going to talk about uh it's technically tokyo but you have to take a 24-hour ferry to get there ah, and it's called the one. galapagos of japan the yes. ogasawara islands so I'm excited to see his videos and photos as he talks. Amazing. Fantastic. Now, uh, you also, let's shift a little bit, talk about compact agriculture. What is this about, Tova? Well, this is interesting because there's been a lot of talk about, um, obviously, sort of food security is a major issue globally with all the, the fires and the extreme weather we've seen, you know, droughts and floods and things like this. A lot of crops are um, getting into trouble. Japan is, you know, no different. We're, we're seeing extreme heat. I know my garden has really, really struggled this year to produce anything. Things have just, um, you know, just fried in the heat. It's just too hot. Um, so this uh, came up, actually, I sort of found the link through the article I was reading about um, the, the building and the wooden buildings and, and how that's moving. And they've got this sort of concept, um, which I, I've seen in other places as well, but for compact agriculture, where food can be grown in an urban environment, um, in a very compact way, um, and using renewable energy, sort of recapturing water, um, sort of cycling the, the air um, within inside and sort of, um, so it's very, it's very clean, it's very safe in that sense, the food, you're not needing to use pesticides and stuff because it's in a controlled environment. Okay, it's not sort of natural and out there. So um, it's maybe a bit of a weird concept for someone like me that grew up on a farm. But, um, you know, I could see this actually having a lot of benefits. And particularly if we're thinking about food security, particularly in somewhere like Japan that, you know, has to import such a large amount of its food um, and with weather systems becoming less stable, things like this, I think are, are going, we're going to see more of it. Um, and so companies that are pioneering this kind of approach on an, you know, a viable commercial scale. There are a lot of great small scale solutions out there, um, which is, you know, wonderful to see. Um, I know people like John Walsh are doing a great job with um, sort of urban gardening and getting companies and schools involved in some, you know, uh, small scale projects like that, which is a really brilliant thing and, and gets people also more, more connected to how food is produced. Um, but I think we're going to need a lot more than that. So it's interesting to see, sort of how that space is developing, look at what the options could be. One thing I liked about this um, project from Obayashi um, is that uh, it's not just in a closed off building that nobody sees, right? So they've tried to make it so that, that there would still be sort of um, visibility, that the greenery would be visible to the local community and residents so that people still feel connected. They're seeing how the food is growing. So they're understanding more about the natural cycle rather than just seeing something in a, you know, in, on a supermarket shelf and having no concept of how it's produced. And also, I mean, if, if it's produced locally, you haven't got the, the carbon footprint and the, the issues of um, transportation, logistics there, food loss. And you know, a lot of that happens in the, the um transportation phase so it would also get around issues like that so i think a lot of benefits um it's still evolving but i'm really curious to see how this moves um and hopefully quickly <laughs> to yeah. a really viable commercial scale yeah it's really exciting and it's it's interesting like when i talked to farmers uh part of my trip back i stopped over in nagano i talked to heather fukase of nagano naturally and visited her on the farm. I've got great footage that I'll be uploading on my channel. Um, but she talked about how even in Nagano, famous for apples, the mm. apples have been burning in the right. sun. Yeah. 
Um, yeah. There's there's extreme heat, uh, the hottest ever. So they're having to really reconsider how they grow crops. She does everything organically and she's very proud of that and yeah. excited. And uh, all the other farmers at first, when she started, told her it's never going to work. And now she's converted some, you know, Brilliant. like, they're like yeah. wow, yeah. how are you doing that? Um, but she said one of the interesting reasons she got really excited about farming in Nagano is her neighbor, when they moved there, never had to water her plants. Huh. That she was like, I'll help you watering. And the 90-year-old lady was like, I don't ever water my plants. That's why <laughs> farming in Nagano is great. But, you know, <laughs> places that have never had rain or yeah. water issues climate is changing so now it is a yeah. concern right yeah, yeah so definitely. the whole system really has to be reconsidered but people on the ground like farmers they're ahead of the game because they yeah. see it every day right absolutely absolutely and i don't think there's enough understanding yet um you know in the general society of the challenges farmers are dealing with and you know farmers i, I get very frustrated coming from a farming background and you know my my brother-in-law is still a farmer but you know, when people are saying, oh, well, farming's responsible for all these, you know, the pollution and emissions and this, that and the other. But then on the other hand, we still expect them to produce all our food and the supermarket shelves to be fully stocked. So it's yeah. it's like, well, OK, so how can we understand better the challenges they're facing and support them in the transition to more regenerative practices? Because you can't do that for free. It Absolutely. takes you know, a change in, you know, understanding, in building knowledge in new practices, but also it might well require investment um, in new technology and, and um, machinery and stuff as well. So that is not very well yet understood, I think, outside farming in general. Yeah, absolutely. Support your local farmers, folks. Uh, if you can find a local farmer, you can do a subscription box weekly or monthly. That really helps um, from what I've heard from the farmers I've talked to. Also, a lot of the fields that were abandoned around where Heather is have been just uh, planted with soba. And soba is a really nitrogen fixing, great crop, very easy for companies to do. So also eat your soba, folks. Go and <laughs> eat those soba noodles. It's perfect in summer. I love zaru soba. It's fantastic. And it's mostly grown in Japan. So yeah. it just happens to be a more sustainable crop. So, mm -hmm. you know, making choices like that is also great. Absolutely. Yeah. Now, uh, let's talk about Volvo. Let's get back to EVs. You had some interesting insights there. Yeah, well, we've been talking to um, Nico Mira recently, the head of uh, sustainability for Volvo Japan, and um, we're sort of hearing about their uh, new studio that you can see there in central Tokyo, which is a beautiful building. I'm actually going to be visiting there tomorrow um, to have a look about, at it. And they've got their, their new um, all-electric model uh, on display there so you can go and have a look but what was sort of interesting beyond the, the the lovely studio and the aesthetics of it is that Volvo are really very ambitious in their um, transition to EV and they've got a, a goal of being fully electric by 2030 which is pretty soon 50% by um, 2025 so just over a year away and they're well on track to actually achieve that um we hear a lot of companies talking about these goals but often you know when you look to see what the plan is and how realistic it is that they're, they're still very vague or just way off track whereas volvo really is you know on track if not ahead to achieve that so it's really great to see um and they're, they're doing well in a lot of areas and one thing i really like about their approach is that sort of here in Japan, um, Nico and his team are working with the local dealers to really help them understand how do they engage with their customers on this and, and talking about why Volvo is making this transition to, to fully EV and, um, you know, what the benefits for all of us are. And so, you know, obviously for the salespeople, um, they're not directly employed by Volvo. They're independent dealerships. They've got their sales targets to meet. That's tough. They're under a lot of pressure to achieve those. But if they can be given the um, 
you know, the information they need and the understanding they need to be able to engage with their customers, then they can see that as an opportunity actually to get an edge over the competition. So I think um, they're approaching it in a really good way. Um, and as a company, I'm just really pleased to, to see that they are really kind of making ambitious goals and are properly setting their science-based targets and sticking to those. So uh, good to see. And I'll, I'll upload uh, some pictures and stuff tomorrow when I, when I go and visit. Yeah, excellent. And very exciting to see the movement finally in Japan. Yes. Uh, part, of, part of my trip to Sado, the reason I chose to drive a thousand kilometers each way uh, was to challenge how driving an electric car in Japan over such long distances, how does it work? I was mostly using the Tesla superchargers. Uh, they're staggered about 200 kilometers away along that route. Absolutely no problem there. Um, but once I reached a remote island, there was no <laughs> Tesla chargers. Uh, luckily, there was a Nissan dealer. I was able to sign up for Nissan's 500 yen a month so I can use all the uh, charging network. And there's a lot around Japan. Um, mm -hmm. So it was, I'll be doing an article and videos about this, but um, it was a lot easier than I expected. I didn't have too much panic, especially <laughs> once, I got, once I got the card, I could use any charger. I had a lot more relaxed uh, feeling about my my distances. Um, but Japan is really well set up for electric cars. So really, so with that foundation, we've got a lot of companies um, that can start offering great cars, hopefully. Right. Well, they're running out of excuses now, right? <laughs> Exactly. exactly. Infrastructure is not going to be one of them anymore. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, let, let's see more companies raising the bar, please, particularly the domestic ones. Yes, absolutely. Mm. Uh, now, you had a One Young World event in Belfast. Uh, so this was the send off for the Belfast Summit. Um, so One Young World is a, a UK based MPO that is kind of like the, the young Davos for, for next gen leaders. Um, so the summit happens in a different city around the world every year. Um, and this year it's in Belfast in Northern Ireland. And it's actually the 25th anniversary this year of the Good Friday Agreement that ended uh, what was referred to as the Troubles, um, the conflict in Northern Ireland. So the One Young World Summit will be part of that. And there'll be a big focus on peace and conflict resolution, um, as well as you know, other really important uh, topics like climate crisis, food security, mental health, and so on. So from Japan, we've got over 100 uh, delegates, um, uh, Japanese, of course, but also non-Japanese who are based here. A lot of them are going over um, sort of as... Uh, representatives of their company. So we're taking a team of, of 13 um, young leaders from one of our clients, for example. And as well as going to the summit, they'll also be working on uh, an SDGs focused project. So a sort of sustainability entrepreneurship program that runs for, for nine months with the summit as a really key element of that. So uh, we had the send off event in Tokyo last week, um, and we'll be off to Belfast at the beginning of October for that. Um, so it's really great to see more companies getting involved, understanding how they can empower their young leaders actually to learn more about the issues out there, to see what other countries, other companies are doing, um, and then support them to actually drive things internally, right? So it's, it, yes, it needs to come from the top when we're talking about sustainability transformation. But also, if companies want to keep and attract, um, you know, the, the best young talent, they need to be providing opportunities for meaningful work for, you know, impact beyond just the, the profit. So uh, it's great to see more companies sort of getting that awareness and actually committing to it as well. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, with our recent topic talking about the SDGs manga uh, and this young one, one, one young world, uh, <laughs> it's all about education and uh, creating mm. great support uh, for our future leaders. Mm. And it uh, kind of ties into your next uh, topic about ESS. Yep. So the last one is uh, my daughter's just starting her uh 
IB, her last two years of um, international baccalaureate um, at school. And so new subject uh, that's only come up in recent years called ESS, so Environmental Systems and Societies. And I was really blown away with the, the topics they're doing, the breadth, the, um, the quality of conversations that they're having in that. I mean, it's only been a couple of weeks into to term so far, but you can see from the topics that are covered there and you know, what they're expected to do, it's going to be really, really useful information when these people then go out into the world and have a much better understanding of how the environment and society connects together, how we as humans are impacting what we need to be conscious of, you know, things like understanding tipping points um, of different environmental systems and things like this and, and how humanity is impacting those. So I'm really looking forward to um, sort of seeing her go through his program. I should be learning as well, updating my own knowledge, um, <laughs> reading over her shoulder, I'm sure, or uh, uh, having a look at the articles too. So there's some good things happening in education. We need to see more, but it, it's good to see subjects like this coming up as an option for, you know, really in-depth study. Yeah. And that IB program, International Baccalaureate, um, my son went through it and ESS was one of the reasons he chose to study environmental studies at Brilliant. university. And he just started in the Netherlands right now. Fantastic. Um, yeah, yeah. So it's doing good stuff. And there are IB schools all over Japan, as well as this standard curriculum around the world. And it connects like One Young World. It connects students to other students around the world who are yeah. doing similar studies. And I think we need more of that, like international collaboration in education, right? So. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, brilliant, Tova, that is our 30 minutes. Thank you again so much. Uh, we will be back next month for our September highlights. Thanks Looking so much, everyone, for joining. Have a great Thank day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Bye.